it's me, Michelle from Lab Muffin, with more Science Meets Beauty. I keep coming across recipes for DIY sunscreen, so I thought I'd make a video about them. There are rumours that store-bought sunscreens are toxic and may even be more harmful than the sun itself. So many people are turning to DIY sunscreens using what's considered the safest sunscreen ingredient, zinc oxide, commonly called zinc. The ingredients of a store-bought zinc oxide sunscreen look something like this in Australia. Active ingredients, zinc oxide, 15%. So you'd think that mixing 15% zinc oxide into a base would give you SPF 50, right? And sunscreen can be quite expensive as well, so it's fantastic for your budget. That's what people are thinking when they whip up a DIY sunscreen recipe that looks something like this. Oils, zinc oxide, stir a few times. Sometimes people even slap an SPF label on it and sell it. Unfortunately, this is a terrible idea. There's a good reason that sunscreen is treated legally as a medicine. People put on sunscreen that's labelled SPF 30, go into the sun's cancer-causing UV rays, and expect the sunscreen to protect them. Because cancer is a pretty big deal, most countries have lots of regulations around sunscreen. Think about the other things that protect you and your loved ones from death. Would you put on a radiation suit you found on Pinterest before going into a nuclear zone? Would you trust a DIY seatbelt? A DIY guide to surgery? A DIY roller coaster you found on a blog? Please don't say yes. In case you think skin cancer is no big deal, here are some statistics on it. Two in three Australians have skin cancer by 70. There's one melanoma death in the US every hour. Your risk of melanoma doubles if you've had more than five sunburns. And daily sunscreen reduces your risk of squamous cell carcinoma by 40% and melanoma by 50%. So now that you know how important sun protection is, how do you make sure a sunscreen works? Here's where SPF comes in. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. It tells you how much protection from sunburn you get with sunscreen compared to nothing at all. For example, with SPF 30 sunscreen, your skin can handle 30 times as much UV before burning if you apply the right amount. UV changes with the time of day and with clouds, so SPF testing uses special UV lamps in the lab. Testing sunscreen on microscope slides is unreliable, so it's tested on actual human volunteers. Two milligrams of sunscreen are applied per square centimetre of skin for the test. There's also a broad spectrum requirement in most places, which means that the sunscreen has a decent level of protection against UVA. Sunburn is mostly caused by shorter wavelength UVB, but newer research has found that longer wavelength UVA is also damaging. Both contribute to skin ageing and cancer. Because proper SPF testing is quite complicated, it costs thousands of dollars. There are other regulations around drugs and that costs even more. That's part of the reason why sunscreen is expensive. Another reason sunscreen is expensive is that it's very difficult to make a product that reliably protects you from the sun. Unfortunately, it's more complicated than just using the right amount of UV protective ingredients. Cosmetic formulators consider sunscreen one of the most difficult products to formulate because changing almost any tiny thing will change the final SPF. The TGA in Australia states in their testing guidelines, the SPF and other physical properties of a sunscreen are affected not only by the active ingredients, but also by the base. Cosmetic chemists use the amount of active ingredient as the starting point for a sunscreen. There's still a lot of trial and error before they can make a sunscreen that works. And it's not just working out what to put in the other 85%. There are a ton of factors to consider when making an effective sunscreen. There are whole textbooks written on it. Here are some of the other factors that will affect SPF. Distribution of the active in the sunscreen, interactions between different ingredients, the pH of the sunscreen, how the sunscreen's been mixed, how the sunscreen applies on skin, how the sunscreen dries on skin, separation and degradation on the skin, settling and degradation in the bottle over time. The amount of active ingredient is only one tiny part of the puzzle. Let's look at just one factor, pH. Zinc oxide dissolves below pH 7, and when it's dissolved, it won't give any protection. Your skin and sweat are both below pH 7, so the pH of the sunscreen will drop as you're wearing it. Proper sunscreens are formulated to avoid this problem. You can see here the different SPFs you get with similar amounts of zinc oxide. 
15% zinc gives one sunscreen SPF 50 plus, 19% zinc gives another sunscreen SPF 15, the BASF calculator, a tool that cosmetic chemists use as a starting point for formulations, tells us that 20% zinc gives us SPF 8 or 13. So there isn't a straightforward relationship between the amount of active ingredient and SPF. Let's say you've managed to get exactly the same ingredients as a commercial zinc oxide sunscreen, and you're ready to mix them together. You still won't necessarily be able to make a sunscreen that works because just like cooking, the sunscreen ingredients need to be mixed in the right way. Zinc oxide is a particularly annoying ingredient to use in sunscreens because it's notorious for clumping up. This is a problem because bigger particles mean poorer coverage. For example, if you have a cherry, it'll cover the area the size of a cherry. But if you smash it up into juice, you can use it to cover a much larger area, even though you've used the same amount of cherry. Again, 15% zinc oxide doesn't always give the same protection. Here's a table from a zinc oxide supplier showing the SPF values you get from two different sizes of particles. Even with the same percent zinc oxide, the SPF halves when you change the particle size. Most DIY sunscreen recipes don't recommend the right size of zinc. But even if you buy the right size of zinc, it doesn't mean it'll work, because when zinc oxide clumps up, it turns into bigger particles. How can you stop the zinc oxide from clumping? In commercial sunscreens, zinc is usually coated with ingredients that make it clump less, but DIY sunscreens use uncoated zinc oxide because the coatings aren't natural. Even when coated, zinc oxide requires industrial homogenizers, which are super-powered electric mixers, to spread the particles out. Both of these sunscreens look even when you apply them, but when you look at them under a microscope, you can see the tiny holes where you'll get no protection. In fact, you can get worse than no protection because oils can increase UV damage. Zinc also clumps up and settles over time, even in some commercial sunscreens that have passed SPF testing. So even if you somehow manage to get the DIY sunscreen to work one time, the sunscreen probably won't be the same when you use it the second time. It can also clump up as you apply it. Again, the clumping might not be visible. So in summary, a sunscreen's effectiveness doesn't depend on the amount of a single ingredient it contains. It doesn't even depend on the amounts of all the ingredients it contains. The process of making the sunscreen makes a big difference too, and shaking it in a jar or using an electric mixer won't cut it. I mean, this bowl contains the same cake ingredients as this delicious, delicious batter. But it won't turn out the same when you bake it. Official SPF testing uses human volunteers. But that doesn't mean testing it on yourself is a good idea. The test needs to be done in a reliable way that will reflect whether it will be effective for most people in real life. Just like how my grandma smoked like a chimney, had one kidney and lived till 90, a sunscreen that you wore while not burning isn't necessarily an effective sunscreen. Were there any clouds that day? What was the UV like at that time of year? What was the time of day? Do you have sun resistant skin? Did you go into the shade? How often were you facing so that your skin was in the shade? How much did you sweat? Did the sunscreen brush against clothing? There are too many variables, so if it worked, all you can say is that it worked for you in that exact situation once. In proper SPF testing, they control for all these variables. Sunburn is also only one of the effects of UV. Sunburn mostly happens due to UVB, but UVA still causes cancer, pigmentation and wrinkles. Even if you don't get burnt using a DIY sunscreen, you're potentially exposing yourself to some serious UVA damage that you won't know about until many years later. Sunscreen may be expensive, but it's expensive because it's effective, and it's much cheaper than skin cancer. There aren't any studies showing that sunscreen chemicals cause more harm than good. They definitely protect against skin cancer and aging, according to the most recent studies. There's some speculation that sunscreen ingredients can cause endocrine disruption, but the in vitro and animal studies that found that use way, way more than you'd ever be exposed to. There's also concern about nanoparticles, but the current evidence shows that they don't pass through the skin's surface. Allergic reactions are a real risk though, so make sure you patch test if your skin is sensitive. Aside from that, the UV protective benefits of using a proper sunscreen outweigh the risks. Unfortunately, DIY sunscreen isn't better than nothing. 
First, people stay in the sun longer if they think they're protected, so you'd get more sun damage overall. Secondly, oils don't give good sun protection. In fact, oils can sometimes increase sun damage. If there are microscopic holes in your sunscreen, you'll have no protection there, possibly worse than no protection. Finally, zinc oxide itself can be a problem. A lot of DIY recipes tell you to use uncoated zinc oxide because it's supposedly more natural. But uncoated zinc oxide is photoreactive. This means that when it's exposed to UV, it will react with other substances to produce free radicals, one of the big causes of skin damage. Coating the zinc oxide stops this from happening. While we don't know whether the amount of free radicals has a big effect on the skin, you're potentially causing extra damage. By wearing DIY sunscreen, you might actually give yourself more sun damage than wearing nothing at all. Keeping in mind the scary skin cancer stats I showed you earlier, this is pretty darn scary. DIY sunscreens are a bad idea because it's incredibly unlikely that you've managed to make something that can reliably protect you from cancer causing UV rays. And DIY sunscreen can potentially expose you to more damage than nothing at all. Save DIY for things that don't run the risk of giving you cancer. If you're still worried about the dangers of sunscreen, then don't use them and practice sun avoidance. Stay in the shade or wear sun protective clothing. Or you can choose to only buy sunscreens containing ingredients you regard as safe. Don't repost DIY recipes and encourage other people to try them, even if they worked for you. You don't want to be responsible for their skin cancer. If you see people selling DIY sunscreen illegally, you can report it via the links I've provided in the caption. I hope this video made sense to you. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it. You might also like to check out my blog, watch the other videos on my channel and subscribe.